What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football channel. It's your boy Nick. If you're new, welcome to the channel. Today we are getting right back into the NFC South team outlooks. As you know, we hit my Falcons. We hit last episode Tampa Bay. We're going with the New Orleans Saints down in NOLA. Always a high-powered offense. Should be a lot of good weapons here. A lot to talk about today. So make sure if you like the video, give it that thumbs up and subscribe if you're new. Let's get right into it. All right, so we got Drew Brees. Drew Brees, Drew Brees. If you've been following me for the last couple months, he was on my list of top five busts this year. And I got a lot of backlash on that. And I think a lot of it comes from the term bust. Depending on what you think the term bust means, I'm more of an undervalued, overvalued kind of person when it comes to bust and sleepers, right? I don't think Brees is going to have a bad year. I'm not going to be mad if he's my fantasy quarterback, but I think he's overvalued where he's getting picked, and there's a few reasons why. He's going as quarterback four right now, the fourth quarterback off the board behind Brady, Rodgers, Luck, and then it's Brees. He's at pick 59 overall. It's deserved. He's thrown for like 4,800 yards in about 17 straight seasons. He's always like a top five fantasy quarterback at the end of the year. My problem is this. He lost Brandon Cooks, right? Obviously, we know how big of a weapon Cooks has been. He adds eight, nine, 10 touchdowns, 1,200-ish receiving yards to that, to that team. But he, he has a, a presence on the team that not a lot of players in the entire NFL have, right? One of the few players in the league, like o Odell Beckham, even skeptical to put Antonio Brown in that argument that can turn an eight yard, a five yard slant into a 90 yard touchdown. We saw that happen a couple times with Breeze last year, right? Now Cooks is taken out of the equation. So we had a couple games where Breeze was having, you know, subpar games, whatever, average games. And then one of those big plays came, really shooting him up to the top five in the fantasy for the weekly rankings. Um, and he's not going to have that piece of the game this year. Another reason I think he's going to kind of dip down this year is the fact that you know, they're always a top five passing offense, passing volume. Last year, he had a career high in pass attempts. I think he threw it, let me see, 673 times, which is a career high for him. He was only the ninth most efficient quarterback in fantasy in terms of uh, points per drop back. So the volume there obviously played a large role in terms of why he finished as quarterback four. Now, again, career high in pass attempts last year would assume they're going to go back down a little bit. They signed Adrian Peterson. You have to think they're looking to run the ball a little more, right? Be a more balanced offense. They're a terrible defense, right? I think they were 31st in the league in terms of points allowed. So bringing in a guy like Adrian Peterson lets you take time off the clock, right? Keeps your defense a little more rested than normal. When you have Breeze marching down the field, throwing it 50,000 times a game, your defense is constantly on the field, thus letting up a ton of points. When you have Adrian Peterson, he's eating up the clock, right? So that's less time for Breeze to navigate through the air. Uh, I just think that the volume for Breeze dips down a little bit from his career high. I think that Adrian Peterson coming onto the team along with Ingram, obviously, is is a more focus on the ground game. So if we see the volume dip a little bit, as I said, he was the ninth most efficient in points per drop back. We'll see his overall ranking drop a little bit. And when, when you start looking at the rankings at the end of the year, this is what I'm saying. It's, it's when he's getting picked 59th overall, I don't think he's going to have a bad year. Again, I'm not going to be pissed if he's my quarterback, but I would rather wait, let me see, 20 picks for Russell Wilson, 30 picks for Matt Ryan, or 40 picks for any of these guys, Mariota, Cam Newton, Derek Carr, Kirk Cousins. So with that fifth, sixth round pick in some leagues that are less competitive that take quarterbacks early, third, fourth, fifth, I've seen them go in, in non-competitive leagues that early, get a nice running back, get a nice wide receiver, wait five rounds and take Kirk Cousins, take Matt Ryan, something like that. That's my beef with Breeze this year. Who I don't have a beef with is his number one wideout, Michael Thomas. Absolutely exploded last year, dynamite rookie season, big athletic freak, just a an unbelievable number one there, 6'2", 215, the fourth best rookie fantasy year ever, according to Pro Football Focus. 92 catches, 1,173 yards, nine tutties. He took over as the centerpiece of that offense, even while Cooks was there. Now Cooks is gone. He's the unquestioned leader on Breeze's group of weapons here. Should be a huge year for him. He started out kind of slow. He only played in 15 games, still wound up as wide receiver seven in PPR leagues. From, from week six to 17, he was fantasy's wide receiver three, only behind Jordy and Odell Beckham. He had nearly double the, the number of targets inside the opponent's 10-yard line as 
almost anyone on the team. He had 11 and the next leader was like six. So he's a huge piece of that offensive part of the field as well, which is really big for fantasy because those usually carry over from year to year. And when I originally made my, I made a mock draft video for fantasy for this year, like months ago, when, when last year just ended because I wanted to get right into it. And I was, I hadn't seen any articles or anything, read any mock drafts, but I had Michael Thomas going like 15 overall. And I was like, I'm going to be probably a round higher than every single other person. You know, I'm going to be so much higher than Michael Thomas. Turns out that's not the case. Right now he's getting picked 13th overall as wide receiver six off the board. He's ahead of T.Y. Hilton, ahead of Amari Cooper, ahead of Des Bryant. All, I think that's reasonable. I don't know if you can make a real argument of, about picking any of those dudes over uh, Michael Thomas. You know, he's a locked and loaded uh, fantasy wide receiver one. Mix of athleticism, size, speed, great hands. Uh, he dropped, let me see, fifth highest catch percentage in the NFL for guys that had at least 90 targets. Wouldn't shock anyone to see him finish in the top five, top three at the position this year. The only thing that does concern me with Thomas is I kind of think his ceiling is being baked into his ADP a little bit. So you look at Drew Brees, right? He's a smaller guy and he operates behind a big offensive line. So the way he's always had success navigating down the field is not locking in on, on certain players, right? He he sees the field from his vision and he, he takes what's given to him. He spreads the ball around a lot. So listen to this stat. Since 2010, they've been ranked, the Saints have been ranked in the top five in pass attempts every single season since 2010. They've never had a player with 100 catches or more. So kind of take that for what you want. I think it says that Breeze doesn't force things. I think he understands how good Michael Thomas is. I don't think that means he's going to try to target him 160 times like you'd see with a lot of these other uh, elite wide receivers. So I think he's going around the right spot in terms of wide receiver positioning. I think in terms of overall ADP, though, I see Jay Ajayi and I see DeMarco Murray going after Michael Thomas in drafts. And those are two guys that I would take before him. Next, you have Willie Sneed, the wide receiver two on the depth chart. He's been creeping up my rankings really, really quickly this offseason. Uh, one of my top breakout candidates for 2017. What I love about him is you've seen the production already in this offense, right? You've seen back-to-back -back 895 as a rookie year, 900 and I think it was like 80 yards last year. So you've seen him put up two back-to-back -back productive seasons. He ranked ninth in the NFL last year in yards uh, yards per reception, 9.3 among receivers with 95 targets or more. Not only a possession receiver, he runs all the all the routes really well, but he's a deep threat as well. You know, the, the yards per reception are up there with a lot of good players. I think the biggest hit that he's gonna take is having Ted Ginn on, on, the, on the team now. So you have Ted Ginn, you know, taking a lot of those Hail Mary passes, but I don't think that's where Snead excels. Now I want you to look at this chart I'm going to put up, and this was done by, but it's from Roto World, it's in, from an article called Your Need for Willie Sneed, basically charted Willie Sneed's route, and you can see every single one of his routes were extremely successful against coverage, except for the nine, which is where Teddy Ginn would take away anyway. So he's just a great wide receiver, undervalued in terms of a player in the NFL and undervalued as what he can bring to the table in fantasy this year. So he's going to be the unquestioned number two in an offense that's ranked top five in pass attempts over the last seven years now, right? He's going to start in all two wide receiver sets and, and the report said he's going to be the slot in 11 personnel plays. Um, so as per Roto World, I'm going to read this off to you. So in games where Willie Sneed played at least 70% of the Saints offensive snaps last season, he averaged almost nine targets, six and a half catches, and 81 receiving yards a game. His touchdown total has not been high. He's only scored around three or four touchdowns each year. But I think the fact that Cooks is gone is is going to give him a lot more opportunity. And I think, you know, just the yardage and the catches by themselves are going to be really big for him and for fantasy owners. So we've seen his floor, right? It's 100 plus targets both years, 900 plus receiving yards and around four touchdowns. So we've seen his floor. We haven't seen the guy's ceiling, which is what I bet he finishes closer towards next year. At worst case, right, you're, get, you're picking him, pick 56, wide receiver 28. Worst case, you're getting 100 targets, 900 yards. There is no way that that is where he'll end up this year, though. He's going to take that next step just given the opportunity that's going to be there for him to do so. So his ceiling, like I said, it's unknown, but it's going to be pretty high, I bet. I'll definitely be owning uh, Sneed in a good amount of my league, so I'm excited to have him on the team. I think he's ready for a big-ass year in 2017. And next we have uh, Ted Ginn. It's going to be the same role as he's played in every every offense that he's been in. He is the human version of the bomb. Y'all remember NFL Blitz back in the day, the bomb. If he was a real baller, that's all you pick. You know, it wouldn't surprise me to see a big year out again, just considering he's going to be playing in the Dome. He's going to be playing with Drew Brees, who has a cannon for an arm, obviously. A lot of things that add up well for him. But uh, be realistic, he was wide receiver. I think it was 57, something in the 50s last year in fantasy. So he's a boomer bust guy. He's a better best ball pick than, than a redraft league. I won't be taking many of my redraft leagues. Could be... 
Could be like a fill-in starter if you're really, really desperate deep in the season, you know, just hoping for a long ball, because that's definitely possible. I, I bet he connects on about five or six of those long balls from Breeze this year, so nothing more than like a wide receiver five. When we look at the tight end now, a lot of people wasted some high capital on Kobe Fleener this year. Didn't work out. He was really bad last year. Uh, I actually think he's in a good position now to be like a post-type sleeper, where a lot of people loved him last year, did shitty, and now he's going really far off in drafts. He's going off the board 139th overall, tight end 15. He finished last year as tight end 15 in PPR, tight end 13 in standard. Terrible compared to where he was picked. You know, you thought he was going to just kind of slide into that Jimmy Graham role. Didn't happen. But now he gets a second chance in 2017. They don't have anyone else to compete for targets with at that position. And you have Brandon Cooks who took away a lot of the targets from... I know he played a lot on the outside, but sometimes he was on the slot and he would take away those middle targets. So that's that's a positive for Fleener, I would say. And Fleener flashed last year. Like, we've seen him do well in the Colts. He had individual game stat lines, of seven catches, 109 yards and a touchdown, six for 74 and a touchdown, five for 86. So, you know, like the consistency, you have Josh Hill, who he was put on the IR last year with a broken fibula week 13. He's probably going to return eventually, but he's not a big threat to Fleener's workload. So, you know, for someone, Fleener, who averaged five targets a game, you could do worse at the position for a very late round tight end, deeper leagues. And now we get to what everyone's probably been waiting for, the running back situation. Adrian Peterson joins them. Peterson's 32 years old. Coming off an injury last year, he played in only three games. So a lot of question marks here, a lot of, you know, what's going to happen in this backfield. If it, if it wasn't confusing enough, they also picked this kid, Alvin Kamara, out of Tennessee. 67th overall, their third round pick. Supposed to be a pass catching specialist. They're supposed to <clears throat> at least play that role for, for the Saints this year. Here's what I'll say about Kamara. Looked good in college for the Volunteers. There was a report from a beat reporter like a month ago that basically said Kamara's going to play the Darren Sproles role. What I have to say about that is every single offseason there is a report saying this guy is going to play the Darren Sproles role in this offense and how Sean Payton is so excited and how good he looks and how he's going to utilize him. Whether it's C.J. Spiller or Trav Travaris Cadet or whoever the fuck it might be year over year, there's a guy every single season and it happens to be Alvin Kamara this year. So before you pencil him in for 80 catches, I think people need to slow their damn roll. Darren Sproles is not a role. You don't jump into the Darren Sproles role. Darren Sproles is an elite veteran pass catching back in the league that's proved it year in and year out and was absolutely dominant for the Saints. It's not someone you could just someone else you could just stick into that role and assume he's going to have the same success. That's not how it works. But Kamara definitely puts a little stick into Ingram and Pearson side. Right? I could see Kamara coming away with 80 to 100 touches this year, which brings down the ceiling of both of the other running backs if it wasn't already brought down enough by having both of them on the team together, but I'm not uh Kamara's going right now is 132 overall running back 44 guys going after him Jonathan Stewart Darren Sproles even Jamal Charles and probably Thomas Rawls I would take at that spot over Kamara and they're all going after him Kamara's obviously going to have value in PPR leagues that's where you're drafting him if you're in a standard league you're not taking him I don't see him anything more than like an RB5 probably until he actually proves something to me now I still fully expect Mark Ingram to be the top fantasy asset in this backfield for the Saints going into the year I would have I would have penciled him in as, as a high, high upside RB2, or an RB2 with high, high upside. I want to read this stat. I'll put it up. It was a tweet. I'll, I'll put it up now. Mark Ingram had 1,300 total yards and 10 touchdowns last year, despite only receiving 51% of New Orleans carries and 37% of the targets from their backfield. So what I'm saying is, like, there's hard, it's hard to find a guy in the league that's been more efficient with the amount of touches he's gotten over the last couple of years. I know everyone says Sean Payton hates him, but I think they've been running that offense pretty, uh, pretty smoothly, if you ask me. I think they know what they're doing, and I think it says that even if Ingram's volume is not at workhorse level, like it's never really been, he's still very capable of putting up really good numbers. He's a much better pass catcher than Peterson. Peterson's not going to have any passing work in this in this offense. I know it keeps saying reports about how he's going to catch 50 balls this offseason. I mean, this season, he's never done that in his career, so you can get that shit out of here. Ingram's a much better athlete all around, much better pass catcher, so is Kamara, so those two will soak up the targets. Peterson won't. Ingram's ADP has dropped pretty dramatically from where it started, obviously in like the 30s. Now it's at 64, running back 24. 
And I would honestly, I'd say by the time August hits, by the time real drafts hit, I think it's going to go even lower. I think he's probably going to be around 28-ish maybe because Peterson's going off the board to pick 80, RB 32. So Ingram's RB 24, Peterson 32. I would expect that to even out a little more, maybe like 26 and 30 or 27, 29. And at that point, I think Ingram's a value. He's, he's, he's a lock to be in the top 30 at, at the uh, running back position. So if he drops like 28, 27, 28, 29, you're getting him at, at his floor. So Peterson's 32 injury risk for sure. If something were to happen to him, Ingram's right back to that RB2, RB1 spectrum. What I would say though is I think Adrian Peterson has a ton of value in standard leagues. You, you look at the line they're running behind, uh, one of the best offensive running lines in the NFL. I think Peterson's going to get a ton of carries. I think both of them will split carries pretty evenly. Maybe even in in Peterson's favor, he should get a ton of goal line work for a team that scores a lot and is always down in that area of the field. So double digit touchdowns rushing wise is not out of the question for Peterson. I would say in PPR leagues, I would say overall Ingram is still my favorite fantasy asset uh, regardless of format. I'm still taking Ingram ahead of Peterson, standard PPR. Ingram is is a low-end RB2 to me, probably in like 12-team leagues. So in that running back like 24, 25-ish range, I, I like him there. Peterson is an RB3 in PPR leagues, especially in standard. I would say he probably has some low RB2 uh, appeal. Both of them have upside based on injury risk either way. If, if one of them gets injured, the other one is automatically kind of catapulted into that RB1 category. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out for sure. They're going to utilize both guys. Both guys have been very successful in the NFL. There's no reason to, you know, throw one out. Reports have been good for Peterson so far. You know, Sean Payton's been going nuts about him. Like I said, just should be interesting to watch. <sighs> this division overall is just going to be craziness. So that's going to wrap up this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please go just scroll down a little bit. Give that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Go check out my uh, my blog. Go subscribe to the newsletter. Go check out some Big Dogs Got to Eat gear. I don't have any here to show off, but we got some cool stuff on the website. And that's it. So thank you all for sticking around. I actually want to ask one question, I guess, because I always like to end the videos with questions. Would you, uh, fuck it, would you rather have, say they both end up getting picked within like three picks of each other ADP-wise, Half point PPR, Ingram or Adrian Peterson, straight up. If you go Peterson, I want to know your reasoning why. So that's that, and I'll see y'all on the next video.